Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the last day of our conference, The Dignity of the Dead. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Frederick Keck. I don't think I have to introduce him anymore. He conceived the conference together uh, with Misha Gabovic. Uh, who is interested in more information, I refer you to our brochure, who you can pick up uh, downstairs, or if you're watching online, um, you can download it as a PDF from our website. Um, before I give the floor to Frederick Keck, a short reminder to those people watching us online, uh, you are also more than invited to join in the discussion, and you can do so by writing down your questions in the Q&A sections. Um, and we will then read them out loud and answer them. So, um, our first talk, we are returning a bit uh, to, a, to a point where we started, to museums, is about human remains in Baobab trees and anthropology museums, investigative burial practices in Senegal. Frederik Keck, I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for all for being here. So, the opening discussion of our conference has uh, confronted uh, different perspectives uh, of archaeology and anthropology on the display of human remains. Uh, archaeologists on one side work with human remains of a distant past and takes them as documents of a human evolution such as food changes or cultural practices such as uh, techniques of burial. And anthropologists work with human remains coming from distant societies in space and can find the descendants of the persons to restitute their remains after a diplomatic process of recognition. Now, the case I want to tell blurs this opposition, and uh, Liv has already blurred this uh, opposition in a more ethical reflection on the display of human remains. It is the story of uh, human remains that were collected by anthropologists in an African country and are now displayed by archaeologists in this same country. So, if you want, it's a process of restitution that has opened not between European museums and former colonies, but within an African society itself, questioning its management of museums and burial practices. So the Museum of African Civilizations, Musée des Civilisations Noires, uh, opened in 2000, sorry, Museum of Black Civilizations, opened in 2018 in Dakar, the capital city of Senegal. While the second floor displays cultural artifacts and portraits of political leaders to show the creativity of African societies, the first floor narrates the contribution of African societies to human evolution and progress, such as scientific text and archaeological documents. It displays the skull of Tumai, uh, a primate whose age is estimated 7 million years and who was found in 2001 in Chad, that's in the middle. An image of Lucy, the eldest Australopithecus skeleton conserved in the National Museum of Ethiopia. And an exemplar of Homo sapiens sapiens named Homo senegalensis on the right, discovered in 1972. Senegal is one of the only countries in Africa to display human remains in museums. This is due to the teaching of uh, the archaeologist Sheikh Antadiop, whose name has been given to the main university in Dakar and the biggest university in Francophone Africa. Sheikh Antadiop defended the idea that the Egyptian civilization was black based on tests of the skin of mummies. He was working at the French Institute on Black Africa, Institut Fondamental, Institut Français d'Afrique Noire, where he promoted methods of carbon datation. His discourse on nigger antiquity is, can be considered a scientific equivalent of the discourse of Leopold Sédar Senghor, uh, Senegal's first president, on the beauty of the nigger race, I quote. It is still promoted by the um, IFAN, now renamed Fundamental Institute on Black Africa. I became part of a team of archaeologists working at IFAN on human remains when I was working at the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris. They had been in contact with anthropologists who wanted to study the microbiome of African populations before their transformation by European colonization in particular their food and hygiene practices. 
Because I had worked with uh, microbiologists to build collections of influenza viruses in China, I was interested to see how microbes could reveal the changes in relations between humans and their environment in Africa. I was also interested to see how African museums would handle the use of human remains for biological research. This international research team was supervised by Ibrahim Atio, an archaeologist teaching at the University Sheikh Anta Diop in Dakar, who had studied in the United States. He sent to the anthropologist, um, to anthropologists at McMaster University in Ontario, a set of teeth from the skulls that were conserved, conserved at the Ifan. The team in Ontario analyzed the calculus in the calcified dental pulp to see um, what kind of bacteria they found and if they were different from the oral microbiome of the contemporary uh, Senegalese people. So I was not in charge of this analysis, of course. I was in charge of the relations with uh, the source communities. That's the term used in these protocols. The goal was to practice a participatory archaeology in which the findings would be shared with the communities to help them build genealogies. We needed to receive their consent to do the genetic analysis of the microbes in their teeth because it was an, inv in a, an invasive method that destroyed the small, a small part of the teeth. So the first time I entered the meeting room of the IFAN, I was struck to see the shelf where human remains were conserved in the back of the room without a door or a window. That's the, the picture on the, on the left side. And I should have uh, warned you that there would be uh, many human remains in this presentation. And that's actually what students have in their meeting room all the time. So, um, so they, I, I was not warned when I entered this room and I was quite shocked to, to see this. Uh, one of the students, uh, Lamin Gay, was doing Muslim prayers on the side of the room without considering these remains as spiritual or personal entities. Lamin was in charge of investigating the burial practices that made these human remains available. So they were the remains of Griot, a social class in Senegal societies, in charge of singing, cooking, making instruments, and reporting news. Because they had the power of speech, griots were supposed to pollute the soils if they were buried in the soil. Hence, they were buried in baobab trees, gigantic trees growing in the savanna with hollow trunks, and they have holes in, in the bark. This burial practice was particularly spread in the Serea country, the most rural part of the country, uh, so it's the southeast of Dakar. Leopold Sedar Senghor, who came from this area and was educated in Catholicism before joining French elite schools, prohibited this form of burial, burial when he came to power. He allied with Muslim authorities who considered that having a separate burial for part of the population was a rupture of the, of the equality of all humans in front of God. For Ibrahim Mathieu, the archaeologist, who also grew up in the Sierra country, and his student Lamin Gay, who grew up in the Lobi area of Casamance, burial in baobab trees was a superstitious practice that needed to be documented to engage in participatory procedure with the source communities. In the natural reserve of Bandia, situated 60 kilometers away from Dakar, so not in the Sierra country, um, the tour of animal species offered to visitors ends with this baobab tree, where a skull is visible to visitors, and the guide presents it as a tradition of the rural communities of the Sierra country. And this is a picture you can find in many guidebooks of Senegal. This burial practice, which segregated Griot from the rest of the community, also made their remains accessible to robbers. The anthropologist who, in the word uh, of the Museum of Dakar, discovered the skulls in 1965, actually came at night with a car and a rifle in the Serer villages to rob them. Guy Tillmans was born in 1922 in Belgium and died in Dakar in 2001 
Um, and he had founded the anthropology department of the IFAN. He relied on the help of Sir Decor, a military officer, to conduct these nice nightly operations. There were fights with the villagers who knew he came repeatedly. And when we returned to these villages, almost 60 years later, people remembered that the baobab trees had been looted by a white man, which made our uh, diplomatic mission more difficult. Even if most of the members of the mission were uh, Senegalese, I, I was the white man who remembered of this time, who reminded them of this time. Um, Ibai Macho had condemned with strong words the robbing practices of Guy Tillmans in a book published in Leiden uh, in 2013. And um, he condemned them for, both for moral and scientific reasons. And I read part of the quote. This was done without, uh, he particularly criticized the, f the fact that the skulls were separated from the bodies and from the objects with which they were buried. And I quote, this was done without any concern for the impact this practice could have on the emotional well-being of the local populations who related to the sites and without concern for contextual information. Although Tillmans and Decom might have thought they were doing this for the benefit of science, th this practice is to be condemned because it poses ethical and moral problems. Yet, Ibrahim Macho uh, was accused of coming with the same intentions to catch skulls for his research. Indeed, uh, Ibrahim was never quite clear about the fact that he wanted to return the skulls to uh, the Serer communities. What he suggested was rather that we could return the skulls in exchange for other skulls uh, that he would collect in baobab trees. As an archaeologist, he was truly interested in doing biological analysis of the skulls to know about Serer's way of life and genealogies. When he explained that village communities and griot families could benefit from this knowledge, for example, to identify elements of their diet or members of their families, he was opposed with constant rebuttal. Lamin and I were in charge of ethnographically documenting burial practices. The villages we visited had Christian and Muslim cemeteries where people had been buried in the last 50 years. But before the independence and the modernization of Senegal, particularly through the control of crops by the Muslim authorities called Mourid, villages were buried in their own houses or in their own land. They were placed directly, their, their bodies, uh, dead bodies were placed directly in the ground and then when populations converted to Islam uh, in a white tissue. According to our interviews, finding a skeleton or bones in the ground was a familiar encounter, not considered as inauspicious. One had just to rebury them and dig a hole elsewhere to bury the new dead. But Griot couldn't be buried in the land because they had no land. They lived on the money they received from singing the praise of those who needed them. They had the reputation of being greedy because they didn't eat the products of their own uh, land, but they had to buy their food. And it was also said that Griot couldn't be rec recognized by, by, by their, could, sorry, but that Griot could, could be recognized by their stinking smell, which may be due to a different food diet, but also to the fact that their bodies decomposed in the open air. And we received both explanations for this reputation of the bad smell. Um, the narrative we collected showed that the burial of griot in baobab trees was not producing fear among the villagers, but was rather part of some experimental knowledge. An elderly woman told us that when she was a child, her teacher would bring her to baobab tree to teach anatomy, anatomy on the human remains that were on display. This anecdote shows that villagers knew where the burial uh, trees could be found, and that it was a common knowledge shared with children, even if children were instructed not to go there by themselves, because it might be dangerous. An elderly man told us that when the burial of Grio in Baobab trees was forbidden, villagers feared that burying Grio in the soil would contaminate the land. So Muslim authorities took a field as a site of experimentation where they buried uh, a dead Grio. 
And later the villagers said that the rainy season was shorter this, the next year and the crop was less abundant, which they attributed to the contamination of the soil by the dead bodies of the griots. If it was easy to collect narratives about baobab symmetries from the villagers, it was less easy to have the perspective of the griots themselves. Because griots are supposed to sing their genealogies of others, they were not interested to tell us their own genealogies, and they often kept secret their rituals, unless they were given a substantial amount of money. The official narrative was that when a member of a griot family, and this is a picture of the uh, 18th century, a member of the griot family would die, all the griots from surrounding villages would come for the fun funeral. And then men would go to a baobab tree and beat it with a stick so that it opens itself. And then they would fight between them to determine who would carry the body in the tree. Indeed, there was a risk of finding a snake or a beehive associated with the spirits of the land named Pangol. So the man would win the fight and survive the confrontation with the Pangol, would rise up in the hierarchy of the griot and come closer to the king. Indeed, in what is called by some historians the feudal organization of serial societies, griots were associated with the king. When the king would exit a castle to visit another city, Griot would pave his way and sing praises. But if the king was contested by a pretendant to the throne, Griot could be hired to sing another genealogy showing how the king's power was usurpated. This is the, the reason why Griot were both useful and dangerous for the king, and hence the ambivalence of their power which is called the power of the speech uh, in um, Serer genealogies. So villagers translated this ambivalence uh, of power of the speech in a discourse on the contamination of the soil. But the griots themselves were proud to be buried in trees, which they conceived as mausoleums similar to those that were built for the kings. So they presented the baobab tree as a form of natural mausoleum. They explained that because they were so close to the kings, they couldn't be buried in the soil like ordinary villagers. Therefore, griot families in their villages continued to bury their dead in the trees despite the prohibition. And the last burial they remembered was in 2005, but another burial was planned for this year. And the community of griot was investigated included 30 families spread around 10 villages. So we can imagine there were, there were not so many uh, burials. Um, and, and the burial that is taking uh, place this month is particularly important and the lambing is going to um, uh, investigate it. So an anthropological description of baobab symmetries must give an account of the attachment of villages to a practice that is often talked about in Senegal as a survival of the past. It appears as a way to relate humans with the soil and the trees in an environment which changes as an effect of global warming and industrial pollution. When we ask the villagers if the reduction of the rainy season and of the crops could be linked to other factors, they mention the use of pesticides that could have also polluted the soil, but they took the prohibition of the burial of Creo as an indicator, uh, at least uh, chronologically, of environmental changes. I therefore suggest to conceive the baobab symmetries as sentinels of environmental changes in the sense that they allow villagers to imagine the effects of these changing changes through the status of Krio as heralds of the king. So it's a change from uh, a feudal uh, conception of heralds uh, singing praise to the king to a contemporary conception of sentinels indicating environmental change changes. Um, this uh, uh, hypothesis has led our team to suggest a comparison between baobab symmetries and museums under the concept of heritage, which has found various uses in the political language of Senegal. The law on heritage has dedicated a section to the protection of sacred trees to which humans have developed attachments. And this covers baobab trees, but also 
all kinds of trees in villages and even in, in cities. Ibrahim Atio proposed griot communities to protect their baobab trees under this law as a natural heritage. This would include monitoring the health of these trees to avoid their fall. It is often remarked among several communities that the leaves of baobab trees, used as condiments for food, become smaller and that the trees dry because, uh, sorry, the, the, the trees die because of drought. So we have collected narratives of uh, human remains spread on the ground after the tree in which they were buried uh, fell. Considering these cemeteries as heritage would justify in Ibrahim's, Ibrahim's view that these skulls are also exhibited in the Museum of Dakar. At the entrance of the museum is um, um, a, a fake baobab tree where living griots are invited to praise the role of Senegal as a vanguard of the African civilization. President Macky Sall declared at the opening of the museum, uh, and that's the, the quote on the slide, throughout the ages, Africa has invented, shaped, and transformed, thus participating in the constant flow of innovation. Our duty is to remain the vigilant sentinels of our antique heritage. So while human remains in baobab trees are conceived as sentinels of environmental changes that threaten the political power, human remains in the museums are sentinels of the innovation dynamics of the African continent promoted, promoted by um, the, 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 the national state. These two complementary positions may appear as a respectful treatment of the dead, who rather than being separated from the living are integrated in their community as bearing signs of the changes that will affect them. Um, now, I would like to um, develop this hypothesis um, by relating uh, the work I'm doing on um, human rem remains in baobab trees um, with the work I've done previously on uh, pandemic viruses, uh, in which I developed the concept of, of sentinel. Um, so the, um, the, the hypothesis, and there are some uh, arrows missing here, uh, the hypothesis that was that when um, a bird uh, with an influenza virus uh, is detected, it provokes a, a, f um, a public health crisis because it could be the sign uh, of a pandemic outbreak. So biological mutation, and there should be an arrow, uh, a vertical arrow, um, a biological mutation leads to a political intervention, such as, for example, massive culling of poultry, and that's what I've uh, studied in China. Now, uh, these are very spectacular moments uh, when uh, birds in some way become symbols uh, of uh, collective identity because they, um, they bear uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, they, they share uh, um, contagion with humans, but at the same time they are separated uh, from the human community. And in some way it, been, it can be qualified as a sacrifice because they are um, destroyed um, to res restore the community in, in a form of uh, symbolic practice. Now, what I studied was the more daily work uh, of um, surveillance of birds um, that turn them not as symbols of collective identity, but rather as, uh, as sentinels uh, of uh, environmental changes. And this surveillance involves a wide range of actors from those who work with uh, uh, birds as living beings, um, so in the food industry, but also in the markets and in the wild bird reserves, to the other side, which is when birds are considered as, as, as commodity, uh, and that involves uh, uh, associations for the protection of animals, but also the, the media, uh, the health authorities. And in the middle, microbiologists play a mediatory role because they can follow the transformation of the birds between these two poles uh, in the, uh, with varying uh, signs uh, of potential contagion. So what appears as a contradiction in um, uh, a public health outbreak between two views of the same uh, animal uh, is actually transformed into um, a productive uh, perception of the bird as, as a sentinel. And, that's, uh, and, and, and it's also a shift from the, the rural um, perception of birds to a more urban perception of birds as, as commodities. And 
because birds are not associated with uh, rural conditions of life, they are perceived as, as ghosts that return and, and take vengeance uh, on the conditions of treatment. But if they are uh, followed in their uh, conditions of life, then they are perceived as living beings with viruses they share with humans. That's, that's the model of I, I developed. And so I, I, I propose to um, uh, translate it uh, to uh, the debate on repatriation uh, of uh, human remains. Uh, which is often um, displayed as an opposition uh, between uh, the, the metropole and the former colonies, the metropole where human remains are stored, and the former colonies that uh, reclaim uh, the uh, 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 repatriation of their human remains. And um, uh, the, the comparison can be made an, on a kind of metaphorical level because as we've te seen on Thursday, the idea is that there is a form of contagion of the demand of repatriation. If you access one demand of repatriation, then they should, there would be other uh, demands. And, and it would, at, at the end, it, it, there is a risk of emptying out uh, museums. Um, so um, uh, when uh, there is a, uh, 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 a demand that is accessed uh, by there is a political ceremony of repatriation and this uh, remains become symbols of uh, a collective identity but uh, when biologists enter the scene uh, to work on these human remains uh, they can follow uh, the biological mutations uh, of these remains and that can be related to what Alexei has showed about the the living, the transformation of the of the dead body of um, of, of Lenin. So it's this this entrance of biologists in the field uh, of research and discussion on human remains actually turns them from symbols uh, of collective identity to um, uh, sentinels of env environmental changes, and uh, that opens a field of um, participation of. Um, work with different uh, um, actors. So not only um, uh, the media and the associations of indigenous people who are uh, interested in these debates, but also a lot of administrations uh, who have to manage this as diplomatic uh, issues. And uh, on the side of um, the conservation of these uh, human remains, uh, curators and collectors, uh, but also um, the, uh, the the, the, the persons who, who have made these remains, such as craftsmen, shamans, or kings, who know about their conditions uh, of, of use. Uh, and finally, maybe uh, the, 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 the persons themselves from whom these remains have uh, uh, come and who have entered uh, what is called in anthropology um, a biography of, 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 their, of their remains. So following the biography of uh, these human remains from the persons uh, from which they came, uh, or even including uh, animals, um, to uh, the, uh, the public that request their repatriation, we can also um, uh, see how they are transformed as signs uh, of uh, uh, changes uh, and, and, and go below the, uh, the heavy symbolic charges that they carry in ceremonies of repatriation. And uh, what I propose to, 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 to describe in in a process of restitution which is ongoing, which is failing, uh, which is experimental, uh, is uh, to be attentive to the, the changing signs uh, of these remains rather than focus on uh, a ceremony uh, of uh, repatriation. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your question. Thanks, Frederick. This is, this is really fascinating. I'm happy to have now heard a, a more detailed version of this. And it's also really interesting how you're connecting this with your, your work in China. Um, I, I just have a very banal question. Can you describe the actual process of burial in a little more detail? So mm -hmm. you said that the, the tree trunks are hollow, mm -hmm. and then they hit them with sticks until there's an opening mm -hmm. at, at some level, which I didn't quite understand. And then they just put the whole 
dead body in there vertically or I mean can you like give a few more details yeah. because I don't I don't yeah. yet picture how, how this works exactly. Okay. Um, so uh, in the narratives they open the, the tree um, and they, 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 they hit the tree to open a hole in the tree uh, because that's part of showing the strength of the, the person who fights with the tree. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, Physically, uh, bow batteries have holes, so it's possible to actually put bodies uh, inside. And um, from the observations that have been made uh, uh, of the remains, they uh, are, uh, are uh, put um, standing. The, the, the dead bodies are uh, um, so so are entered in a hole, and, and the, the hole must be uh, big enough for the body to keep standing. Uh, and so that when the body is entered into the hole, the, 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 the person who, who puts the body needs to clean uh, the, the hole uh, of, of the previous human remains. So that's why it's, it's, it's really a symmetry in the sense that the, the, holes, the, the bones uh, are scattered around the place and, and they're, they're, they're supposed to, the body is supposed to crush uh, uh, naturally. But the respectable position is to uh, display the, the, the body standing. Immediately after death? I don't know if it's immediately after death, but I imagine because there's, there's no con conservation of the body. We have another, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We have another question by um, uh, Liv Nielsen Stutz. Thank you so much. This is uh, such a great talk. Thank you so much for the work and, and its interesting connections also with the pandemic. There's, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, but I, I was really curious to, to learn more about the attitudes from the Senegalese state in terms of exhibiting human remains. Because what you showed us was um, ancient species like uh, Tumai and uh, Lucy and then this Homo senegalensis. Uh, and then you showed us uh, this collection of crania from this particular group that, from your own uh, mm. description, is kind of very liminal and um, living kind of already on the uh, margins of um, the dominating culture. So I was wondering, what is the policy of the museum in terms of exhibiting uh, human remains from other groups? Is that done mm. in order to build this narrative of mm. uh, black civilization? And uh, uh, is there any distinction being made between the treatment of the human remains from, from this particular group? The, the, how do I spell that? The, the, no, no, the, 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 the griot. The griot. Mm -hmm. griot. Uh, and, uh, and other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, 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 the president of the Museum of Black Civilization is an archaeologist um, from the IFAN uh, and he uh, wants to build a narrative that um, um, all humans descend from Africa and so Africa must take the lead in the history of civilizations and it, 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 doesn't, um, it is not a nationalistic uh, uh, narrative. Uh, it doesn't promote uh, uh, ethnic from Senegal. Uh, Senegal is a very multi, multi-ethnic, multicultural country, um, but uh, it, it wants to revert uh, the idea of the um, uh, of outside of Africa uh, and, and and show the the, the history of, of divergence of different ethnicities in in Africa. So so that's why they can display uh, skulls from all over Africa and not only from from Senegal. Um, and uh, um, the, the, so, so the, the fact that um, uh, this, um, the skulls that they present, the most recent ones, uh, are from uh, Griot uh, and not from village communities uh, is, uh, is troubling and they don't speak about that uh, in the museum um, because um, so Griot is not really uh, like a, it's, it's more a caste than a race or an ethnic in their, in their vocabulary. Uh, and it's a position that can be found in different uh, ethnic groups. Um, 
and uh, it's, it's often the, the Grio are former prisoners, so the, the, the status of, of Grio uh, is, um, is, is discriminatory and they, they're supposed to come from outside. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have this power of speech and not this power of the land. So they don't, uh, they don't publicize the fact that they come from Rio. Uh, and they, they, they prefer to have uh, narratives of the um, ethnic, ethnic groups attached to lands. And, but uh, an archaeologist like Ibrahim Mathieu studies the migrations uh, of uh, groups all over the African continent. Uh, Isabel Reimann. No, uh, behind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your for your talk. It was really interesting. And there, as already was said, there's so many aspects. And I would like to learn a little bit more about this uh, work you did for asking for consent on on, mm -hmm. uh, on working on the remains for yeah. um, research. So, and you already mentioned that there was a problem that in the first instance the grave robbery was um, yeah, still. Um, um, in the memory, and can you talk a little bit about this process and maybe the outcome and uh, mm -hmm. about, about this process of consent? So the writing of consent forms was based on protocols that were applied in Canada, because that's really part of the work of uh, uh, archaeologists with indigenous group in, in Canada. And um, we, so, so it's, 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 a, it's a long document with four or five pages uh, and that um, needs to be uh, read and then, and then signed. Uh, and, and so it, it took us time to uh, find Grio community who wanted to take the time to read uh, the, the documents. Because you, know, you need to, to pass through different heads uh, of villages and different authorities. Um, and and we, we needed to have the consent for the descendants of um, uh, of the people who were buried in the trees, and that's two or three generations. Uh, so we, we actually found just one uh, person who uh, was ready to take the time to read the document with us, and at the end he didn't want to sign it, uh, because he didn't want to engage um, uh, for the rest of his community. So the, the problem is, is, is to individualize one person um, and retract this person from the rest of the community. So I, I, I mean, in my view, this procedure failed uh, uh, to um, uh, grasp the, the, the dynamics of the, the work with the community. So because we didn't get the consent, we couldn't uh, go further with the biological analysis. That's why I didn't present the, the results. Um, they made the first analysis, but they said we don't want to go further without the consent. Uh, and that's why we, consti we continue to investigate the burial practices. Um, and, um, and, and we want to continue uh, informing uh, the communities about the, 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 the results, the potential results but we have stopped doing the, the consent forms. Uh, Susan Nyman. Uh, I think my question's already been answered, um, but let me just make sure. I thought Griot was more of a profession than an ethnic group, and yes. you described mm -hmm. it as a caste. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how mm -hmm. all those categories fit together. Could yeah. you perhaps say a little more? Yeah, um, so it, it's, uh, there are two groups uh, that uh, are um, set aside from the, the land, who are the, um, the, the griot and the, the, the blacksmiths. Um, because the blacksmiths also don't produce wells outside of the land and have the power of forging um, metal. And the griot have the power to speak. Uh, and, and they're also groups that come from outside uh, of uh, of, of the village, uh, so they, um, they, they are not considered exactly as, as a race, but at the same time there are uh, biological narratives about their food, about their smell, uh, so it's a way also to naturalize this, this difference. Uh, Martin Chart. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very curious to learn more about the motivation of Guy Tillmans 
Uh, now, here we have a grave robber who gives mm -hmm. up his loot to a museum. And what is this guy doing? What is driving him? Yeah. Um, so he actually uh, wanted to build the IFAN on the model of uh, European museums and collect as many skulls as he could. But he didn't have um, biological procedures or, um, or apostasis uh, to uh, work on this skull. So he published uh, two or three uh, articles based on anthropometry. Uh, to uh, precisely describe um, differences in ethnic groups. Uh, but uh, he, he wanted to leave these skulls for um, future generations. Uh, and and that's, that's why the archaeologists today are very embarrassed by this legacy, uh, because they don't know what to do with them. Uh, and, and, and they still want to promote the kind of... of uh, uh, scientific research, uh, without, with, with, but raising the, the, the ethical uh, uh, issues that, it, that, it, that, that he was not raising. Um, um, but it, it was, it, it, I mean, this uh, skull was not supposed to go to Europe. They were supposed to remain on African soil. That's very important. Uh, I think, Liv, no? It's okay, then Misha. <laughs> So I think you said that Senegal is one of very few countries in Africa that present human remains in museums. So that means that there are some others. Mm -hmm. Could you perhaps say which others and whether they have a similar kind of ideology or narrative behind it or there, is there a variation between them? So uh, from what I gathered, uh, South Africa also present human remains in museums. Uh, based on the uh, collections they have gathered. Of course, it's much more problematic uh, because uh, they, it was constituted during the apartheid. Um, uh, but, um, I mean, this is um, uh, something that I um, uh, heard from uh, a colleague in Oxford who, who works uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, and um, I, I have not made investigation, but um, that's, it told me this was the only, the, the only other country where it was displayed. Yeah. But it was not displayed on the motivation of showing the evolution of African uh, groups. Hmm. Are there any other questions? Well, I just have a comment. Yeah. Maybe. Hmm. It was really a comment uh, that I just think um, sums up the, or ties in with what we were talking about on the first evening mm -hmm. with repatriation and with what to do with collections and uh, the damage done by, by this physical anthropologist still resonates today mm -hmm. in the lack of trust uh, to the point that when you are trying to get informed consent there is, there is uh, so much work left mm -hmm. for us now to to, to kind of try to repair those relationships. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just like a really good example of how we are still, we are still as disciplines mm -hmm. and a kind of adjacent disciplines carrying the burden of these, of these past yeah. actions. Yeah. And it also shows the importance of uh, oral history uh, as it's uh, practiced by uh, the team of, um, uh, uh, of, of Stoker here. Uh, uh, to uh, because uh, what what we show what we realized when we came to the field was that uh, after two or three generations, people still remember uh, the, the presence of these um, white people coming at night to loot the the, the, the cemeteries. Um, uh, so, I mean, the, the, the here it's more complicated because it's it's a separate group uh, that uh, on which there there are less fewer narratives. Um, but I imagine that in, in other uh, contexts um, there would be m much more uh, oral testimonies and, and there, there, here maybe there would be a possibility to do some informed consent. So, so I mean, I mean the, the difficulty we've, we had with informed consent was really linked to the question of secrets and, and the practice of genealogy by this group. Um, but I, I imagine that in other uh, African contexts it, it might be imp important and possible. Are there any more questions or comments? OK, 
Okay, if not, I'm, I, have a, I have a question. Um, uh, you already told us about that you're now not doing the consent forms anymore and you're uh, working with uh, people from the, from the same culture. Do you um, discuss your ideas or the, your findings with them? You said you, the, the burials and the bough trees are changing from symbols to sentinels. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you get back to the people and, and tell them about it? And if so, how do they react? Yes, that's, that's very much part of the interview we make, is that we ask them for um, food uh, and environmental changes um, in the last 60 years. Um, also documenting um, changes in hygiene. Uh, and, and then when they talk about um, the, the uh, we introduced the, the burial of, of Griot uh, as an indicator, uh, a chronological indicator, so the, we don't come to ask them about that, and that, that, that's the easiest part, uh, because if we ask about that, then they are suspicious. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we try to discuss about the correlation between the, the abandonment of the Griot burial and the environmental changes. Yeah. And sometimes they make the correlation, uh, I mean, uh, Naturally, sometimes yeah. they make it more spiritually, okay. uh, and we trace and we trace that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, if there are no more questions or comments, then first of all, thank you very much for your very enlightening talk and for the lively discussion. Thank you.